I couldn't understand why the morning after they shagged, they didn't run away. Uh, this was written for two people who should run away before all the bad stuff. What he's talking about is the track Exit Music for a film, the fourth track on the amazing album OK Computer, and I'm going to break down why I think it's so good. Wake from your sleep The drying of your tears Today we escape we escape. Even without knowing the backstory of what inspired this song, it's always sounded very tragic to me, very heavy, and part of that is because of the harmonic minor scale. You may have also had the thought, wow, this kind of sounds classical, and I totally agree with you. So it stands to reason that one of the tools I should pick up to kind of uh, look under the hood of the song is classical Western tonal harmony, music theory. Every time I say Western tonal harmony, a little bit inside me dies. <laughs> Production-wise, though, there's some really notable things. It starts very intimately, right, with Tom and the acoustic guitar, and then it kind of builds and turns into this psychedelic rock song, and it becomes more and more tragic. This huge climax, everything going at once, and then it all falls away, and he's left all alone with some very unsettling sound design. Oh, and I almost forgot to mention that Johnny's using a Mellotron to trigger these vocal samples in the chorus, which just feels so, like, it's kind of like Uncanny Valley, right? It's like, it's human, but it's it's not. And now for the details. So this song is in 4-4, four, four, but it's a swinging 4-4. Four, four. So by that I mean it goes... Uh, and the guitar pattern, the rhythm guitar pattern, is on the off beats mostly. So it goes... Mm, ja, ja. Why does this matter? It just gives it a certain feel. It sounds more like... A bard is about to tell us the tale. These chords are B minor, B sus two, and B sus four. Let's talk about what that means, sus. Doesn't mean suspicious in this context, it means suspension. This is called the root, the bottom. This is called the third, it's the next note up in the chord, and then the fifth is the one on the top. The third is the one that gives the chord its major or minor designation. It's the heart, I think, of the chord. If you just move your finger down to the next note in the scale, you get this chord. But if you move your finger up to the next note of the scale, you get this chord. The idea is that these notes create tension, create an expectation. You really, really just want to hear it go. <sighs> That's called a resolution. Similarly, you could go the other way, maybe not as satisfying, but especially in minor it is. This is the last thing I'll say. In this intro, the suspensions are being used to resolve to the minor chord, but it goes from the sus2, bounces up to the sus4, and then comes down. So you get like two suspensions in a row. You're like, ah, yes, please resolve that chord. And they do. Ah, finally. And there are so many suspensions coming later in the song that this really is quite on brand to start the song this way. Then as the first verse starts, there's a chord progression that moves away from the B chords. Wake from your sleep The drying of your tears Today we escape We escape Uh, 
So is the tonic chord, the dominant chord, a D major chord, but he sings this tense note against it. Then to this beautiful tense E at nine, back home to the tonic chord, to the tense dominant, then to this gorgeous suspension, which you can feel just needs to resolve to this major chord. I'm gonna get pretty animated talking about this because I think music is amazing, but I just want you to know that there's nothing uh, miraculous about this chord progression, even though I might make it sound like it's absolute magic. So why does this sound so classical? One of the reasons is it makes use of the harmonic minor scale, which I mentioned in my intro. And that scale sounds like this. It's just like minor. But very last minute, the very top of the scale, the last note before you get to the octave is a little higher. You get that big jump. My understanding is that harmonic minor was kind of invented by classical musicians to solve a problem, and the problem was a weak, perfect cadence. What is that? Well, that's another thing that makes this song sound so classical. So let's go there. Perfect cadence sounds like this. I mean, if you had to be like, this is classical music in two chords, I would pick that. That's how classical it sounds. A perfect cadence is between what's called the dominant chord and the tonic chord. What is dominant and tonic? Well, here we go. So a lot of tonal music, music with notes, pitches, I should say, has something called a tonal center, which is where the song feels the most finished and at rest. In the key of B minor, the B minor chord is the tonic chord. So that's what we're looking at in this example. And then the dominant chord is when you count five notes up the scale. Whoopsie, but you can do it for major two, it's fine. F sharp. And then you build a major chord on top of that. And then you go. Suspensions are also used a lot in classical music, as I mentioned, so there's a lot in this song. And lastly, there's something at the end of that progression. You saw me smile, because I can't help it. You have to smile when you play a Picardy third. You just have to. You have to. This is when your song's in minor, but at the end of a phrase or the end of the song itself, you resolve to a major chord, the major tonic chord specifically, my bad, instead of the minor one, which is exactly what they do here. You go through all of this stuff. And a little bit of hope from the Picardy third makes everything sound all the more tragic when it plummets back into minor land. Like the rest of it is the tragedy, but that last chord is their love. In a lot of their other music, Tom's voice does not follow the chords. It kind of pushes against them and plays with them a bit more. So this kind of slots in. It, it conforms to the rules a little bit more. Pack and get dressed Before your father hears us before And what's interesting about his melody that I didn't realize until I analyzed it is that it kind of just goes down the scale. There's a there's a jump, right, when he says drawing of. But otherwise, it's just going down, down, down. And I think subconsciously, downward motion just has a heaviness. It feels so final. It's not particularly hopeful feeling. Tom's voice sounds amazing here. Just really, really gentle, restrained, very low. It definitely matches, I think, the feeling, the heaviness, and then later on, he can kick it up an octave, and there's an incredible contrast and power to that. The second verse has a very important change that I alluded to already, and that's when the subdominant chord, also known as the four chord, 
turns minor. They play it major, and then they play it minor right after. So you feel the angel falling. A lot of Radiohead songs do this. Play the major version of a chord and then turn it minor. So in a single breath, that warmth from this is taken away. So remember I was saying the heart, the heart's on the bottom of the chords. So you really hear the heart just get like tragic. Now onto the chorus, which only happens one time. never comes back, but it has so much gravity. It's in a different key. It gives the impression of suddenly being an A minor, which is not even close to being related to B minor. I would love to know how they came up with that, because it's not really a logical, like, natural choice. So pretty. Starts with this minor chord that resolves to this major chord. It's like the A minor is like the ang anxious, fearful, pained inhale. And then this is the calming, centering, grounding exhale. I, I just love that. Breathe, keep breathing. They have a dramatic relationship. What's so beautiful, I think, is the contrast between these two chords and how Tom sings into the relief. So, he's singing down, kind of the chord. He's actually singing three notes down, kind of the chord, and then three notes down the other chord. So it's actually a pattern. And then, Except when he says, keep breathing, he has this sort of rush delivery, which I love. Breathe. Keep breathing. Right? The, na, 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 na. Oh, so pretty. And then after this moment, it just goes back to B minor. Okay. Now I have something controversial to say. Not really. I always heard the chord progression go like this. Breathe, keep breathing. And back to, oh, sorry. I listen to it again, I'm like, oh, I don't, I'm not sure if I'm actually hearing the note I think I'm hearing. So I'm willing to be wrong about this, but this is how I've always interpreted it. It makes a lot of sense to me, and it also involves my favorite functional chord in the world, the flat six. So I have to, legally, I have to imagine it <laughs> anywhere it might be. At the end there, there's an F sharp sus four. And then it, Meltron goes, then you get major resolution. See, there the sus4 is being used as it was intended to resolve to the major chord. Very classical. So let's talk about this Mellotron. So the Mellotron's a, an older sampling instrument. Never played one, I would love to. It looks crazy weird. But it's basically playing samples with tape. Apparently this sample library they used is called Eight Voice Choir Number One. So it spans, it's, you know, they play it a little bit different probably every time you watch Johnny play it live. It's not voiced exactly the same way. He's essentially outlining the chords that the guitar is, but just the little bit more of a spaced out sort of otherworldly sound. It's not like rich, like four-part harmony. It's more like big open intervals, 
There's usually a higher voice, a lower voice, maybe a middle one. I really like when it goes breathe. I feel you hear breathe. Like there's a, like maybe a voice is going up. Breathe. While he goes down. Breathe. Keep breathing. And I think here it's like, like that. Just like a big, big interval. I've never heard a fake choir that I liked, except in this album. I think it sounds so good. Their choices are very tasteful in general, I think. Then the third verse comes. This is the beginning of the build. There's this sound design I was talking about. Again, I couldn't find out where it came from. I looked up who sampled it, and there's nothing. But it's something. It's something that's vaguely human, but I can't be sure that it actually is human. But it still reminds my lizard brain of humans in trouble. So it's really creepy. And then the drums start to come in, right? They just sort of slowly weasel their way in, fill on the ride cymbal, using it almost like a snare on beats two and four. And then this pink Floydian drum fill comes in. I love that. Now it just feels like psychedelic rock, which I like a lot. And the fourth verse takes us to the top. Great buzzy bass line comes in. I'm assuming this is Colin on the bass, just going through some amazing fuzzy pedal. This fourth verse has a different chord progression. So it starts with B minor, but then it goes to this C sharp major chord. Then it goes to F sharp major then to G major, G major again, then to C major, then to F sharp major, and then we get this. And back to the normal chord progression. This chord progression also sounds kind of classical because it employs something that you could call a secondary dominant. Remember the tonic chord? Okay, so. Remember, this is called the dominant chord because it's the fifth chord, right? One, one, two, three, four, five, major, okay. Every chord has a chord that is five scale notes away from it, and it's called its dominant chord. In the classical realm, my understanding is that secondary dominants set up other chords, so it's like an assist. And what better way to set up a chord in a classical song than to insert right before it its own personal dominant chord, your own. The reason C sharp major doesn't sound like it belongs is because technically it is the dominant chord of F sharp major. See if I go F, one, two, three, four, five, up F sharp major, I get to C sharp. Build a major chord, ta-da. So, you can kind of just work your way around inserting secondary dominance in front of chords. It seems to just sound good. In fact, there are more of those coming. So the, the next one is the G to the C. So <laughs> we got this, then, then to here, which is where we kind of wanted to go. This is, okay, we have to talk about this. This is called a deceptive cadence, my favorite type because the deceptive cadence, instead of going all perfect on us and going, it goes. Hang on, I wasn't quite expecting that. I have been deceived by this flat six chord and I'm not mad about it because it's the best chord in the world. That's kind of what you'd expect, but it goes. now. This chord is a great substitute. It's also just uh, the greatest chord in the world. Great substitute for the tonic chord because it shares two notes in common with it. Okay, but then after this, the G happens again as a secondary dominant for the C chord. See? One, two, three, four, five. And that C chord does not belong in this key either. See how they managed to kind of jerk you around this really interesting chord progression without it feeling, it certainly doesn't feel wrong. 
It feels interesting. It's got, it's dramatic. Stop it off. It goes from C sharp, sorry, C major down to F sharp major. And those chords could not be more unrelated. They are separated by a tritone. Like, maybe there's some music theory rule about this, but this is, this sounds very unusual to me. melody is once again more classical in nature, exploring the notes of the chords, kind of bouncing between them. Do, do, do. That's a creepy melody. Mm-hmm. A spineless. Ooh, okay. There's a lot of these chords in this song too, which I also think maybe added to everything else makes it sound classical. It's the dominant seventh chord. It's gonna it's gonna come back in a second. So spineless laugh. We hope your hope your There's that dominant seventh chord again. Choke, which builds a lot of tension. And then he releases it. Choke you. And now that note is the only note that this dominant chord has in common with its tonic chord. Right there. So it's like he's the bridge. And it's so satisfying. Anytime you play a different chord under the same note, I feel like things happen. Emotions are triggered. It's a new context for that thing. It gives it new meaning. And then we get this amazing climax, right? Now we are one in everlasting. Now here, okay, bass like hits the D and there's no B in sight to sort of weaken it or confuse it. Everlasting, not Everlasting, which would have hit that sort of slightly confusing note. Everlasting. Then, love. That minor thing happens again. That you choke, that you choke. We got to talk about the bass line, and we got to talk about Johnny's tremolo. He's being very careful not to play the same notes that Tom is singing. This makes sense to me, right? He's he's not trying to uh, reinforce what Tom's doing, not until the very, very end. He's just fleshing things out, right? He's making the harmony more robust, fuller, and more varied. It's more balanced that way.
I love it when voices and guitars and voices really in anything that's not a voice harmonizes together because I think it's not as common. I did, I did have caffeine today. I, I think it's, I think I feel it. Okay, now check out this bitchin' bass line. <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't mean to make light of a tragic song. I'm just in a mood. Love it whenever he gets it. Now we are one. I think that's the note that the end it could. Colin has done these kinds of scale like runs before, and I think they're so graceful. I think it was in Subterranean Homesick Alien that there was a lot of this. It works so well. You're going. Very harmonic minor y sound. Just the texture of this bass against the classical backdrop is so interesting to me. Adds a little bit of a bite. And then the climax, which is technically the fifth verse, but it just feels like this is the whole point, right? And it's the same vocal melody as all the other verses, but it's just sung an octave higher, like I mentioned, with a lot more power and a lot more pain, right? Now we are one. And this is also when the Mellotron Choir comes back in. So there's that like transcendent feeling. And the bass line is like a yo-yo. And I, I, I think it might be a little bit weird to try to play exactly on keyboard, but. And then it goes. Then to the D, so that was the F sharp chord, now the, to the D chord. E, B, I hope that you choke, F sharp, that you choke. I love that dog. I love that it goes higher there. I love the way the song just kind of like seeps away from you, right? Just slips through your fingers and then suddenly it feels like you're all alone with Tom again, right? And it feels like the room and the world and then the room and everything just gets smaller and smaller and smaller until the lights completely go out. But you're still left with the guitar and the sound design and the Mellotron, very haunting at the very end, playing these big intervals. I love how the Mellotron decides not to define that last chord very clearly. It just plays this very ambiguous open fifth, whereas the guitar is the one going. But you can barely hear to that point. So there's sort of a, like a, there was a choice, is all I'm saying. There was a choice there not to go. That would follow logically. That they would outline the chords that way with the Mellotron, but. It's a lot less forgiving. That's the end of my analysis. I really hope that you enjoyed it. And if you liked it, like, subscribe and everything. But don't go, don't go, wait. If you want to learn music from me, starting in July, pretty much every Sunday in the afternoon central time, which translates to evening in the UK, I'm going to either be hosting a group Zoom for songwriters and producers to share our knowledge, be accountable to each other, uh, go over projects that we're working on, break things down track by track, commiserate, et cetera, or even collaborate. 
On the other Sundays of the month, I'm going to be teaching something. So one month it's going to be, I'm going to teach you how to play these Nine Inch Nails songs on piano. Another month it might be, here's some music theory fundamentals. Another month it might be how to recognize this chord, right? Or what have you. Composition, arranging. If that interests you, please head to my Patreon and look up the educational tier. It's called Swine. If you're a Nine Inch Nails fan, then you know why. It's $20 a month. And I would love, love, love to have a nice, good group come to these lessons. Oh, and rhythm. Rhythm lessons. We just did a rhythm lesson. That was really fun. You get to participate in the monthly Patreon challenges where I give you a prompt and you write a piece of music or an idea, and then I'm going to listen to it and give you my commentary. All positive. Promise. There's a bunch of other stuff you could do on my Patreon, but that is my primary source of income. It's the reason I can do these things. So if you want to support me, that is probably the best way to do it. If you have song requests, if you have album requests, that is the place to do it. Okay, that's it. And thank you to my patrons for supporting me. And I can't wait to see you all on the next video. Until next time. I look kind of dead. Don't I look kind of dead today? What's up with that?